Elegy written in a country churchyard is a poem written by Thomas Gray in 1751. It is a meditative poem that reflects on the lives of ordinary people buried in a country churchyard. Let's understand the meaning of the poem line by line. The opening line of the poem sets the tone for the elegy. The speaker hears the sound of the evening curfew bell, which marks the end of the day and signals the time for rest and reflection. In the second line, the speaker observes a group of cows slowly walking across a meadow. This pastoral scene is a common sight in the countryside and serves as a reminder of the simplicity of rural life. The third line describes a plowman walking home after a long day of work. The image of the plowman represents the hard-working and humble rural population. The final line of the stanza emphasizes the quietness and stillness of the evening. The speaker feels alone in the darkness, which allows for contemplation and introspection. The second stanza begins with an observation of the fading light. The sun has set, and the landscape is slowly becoming obscured by darkness. The use of the word glimmering suggests that the landscape is still visible, but only faintly. The stillness of the evening is reinforced in the second line of the stanza. The silence is described as solemn adding a tone of sadness or melancholy to the atmosphere. Despite the stillness, the sound of a beetle flying around can be heard. The use of the word droning suggests that the beetle's flight is monotonous and repetitive. In the final line, the speaker hears the distant sound of sheep being herded, which provides a gentle lullaby to the peaceful evening. The third stanza introduces the setting of the poem A Country Churchyard. The speaker observes an ivy-covered tower in the distance. The sound of an owl is heard, which adds to the eeriness of the scene. The word mopping suggests that the owl is unhappy or melancholy. The owl's mournful song reminds the speaker of those who have died and are buried in the churchyard. The word bower suggests a secluded, hidden place, adding to the sense of mystery and melancholy. The final line of the stanza suggests that the presence of the speaker has disturbed the owl's solitude, which serves as a metaphor for the intrusion into the sacred space of the dead. The fourth stanza describes the trees that surround the churchyard. The elms are rugged, which suggests that they are old and weathered. The yew tree is associated with death and mourning. The speaker observes the graves in the churchyard, which are marked by the heaving of the earth. The graves are described as mouldering, which suggests decay and decomposition. The graves are described as narrow cells, which emphasizes the confinement and finality of death. The use of the word forever suggests that death is an eternal state. The people buried in the churchyard are described as the rude forefathers of the hamlet. This phrase suggests that they were simple unsophisticated people who lived in the surrounding area. The next stanza begins with a contemplation of the lives of those buried in the churchyard. The speaker observes the arrival of the morning, which is associated with the scent of incense. This image is often associated with religious rituals and suggests a connection to the spiritual realm. The sound of a bird, the swallow, is heard, which suggests the return of spring and new life. The use of the word strawbilt emphasizes the simplicity of rural life. The sound of a rooster's crow or a horn being blown is heard, which suggests the start of a new day and the possibility of new opportunities. However, the speaker reflects that the people buried in the churchyard will not be awakened by these sounds. They are permanently at rest and will not experience the new day. The speaker reflects on the things that the dead will no longer experience. The image of a blazing hearth suggests warmth and comfort, which is now unavailable to the dead. The speaker reflects on the daily activities of rural life, which include the care of the household. These activities are no longer relevant to the dead. The speaker reflects on the absence of children in the lives of the dead. The use of the word lisp suggests the innocence and youth of the children. The speaker reflects on the affection and love that children share with their fathers. This is no longer possible for the dead. 
the speaker reflects on the lives of the dead, who were likely farmers. The image of a harvest being gathered emphasizes the hard work and labor of their lives. The image of a plow breaking the earth emphasizes the physical labor that was required in farming. The use of the word stubborn suggests that the earth was difficult to work with. The speaker reflects on the joy and happiness that the dead experienced when working with their team of horses. The word jokin suggests a sense of lightheartedness. The speaker reflects on the power and strength of the dead as they worked in the forest. The use of the word study suggests that they were physically strong. The next stanza reflects on the lives of the dead, who were likely unknown and unremarkable people. The speaker addresses the idea of ambition, which suggests a desire for power or success. The speaker suggests that the dead were not ambitious but were still valuable and important. The speaker reflects on the simple joys that the dead experienced in their lives. Their destiny obscure suggests that they were unknown and unremarkable people. The speaker addresses the idea of grandeur, which suggests wealth or high social status. Those with grandeur should not look down upon the lives of the dead, as they were valuable and important in their own way. The speaker reflects on the lives of the poor, who are often overlooked in society. The word annal suggests that the lives of the dead were recorded and remembered, even though they were short and simple. The next stanza reflects on the idea that everyone is equal in death. The speaker reflects on the symbols of wealth and power, such as heraldry, which are the system of official symbols used by nobles and royalty, and pomp, which is the ostentatious display of wealth and power. The speaker suggests that these things do not matter in death, as everyone is equal. The speaker reflects on the idea that beauty and wealth are fleeting and do not matter in death. Everyone will experience the same inevitable fate of death, regardless of their wealth or beauty. The speaker reflects on the idea that even those who achieve great success or glory in life will still face the same fate of death. The use of the word led suggests that the pursuit of glory ultimately leads to the grave. The next stanza reflects on the speaker's own mortality. The speaker addresses those who may look down upon the dead and suggests that they should not be judged for their simple lives. The word fall suggests that there is nothing wrong with the lives of the dead. The speaker suggests that the dead may not have any grand monuments or memorials to remember them by. The use of the word trophy suggests that the dead may not have achieved great success in life. The peeling anthem swells the note of praise. The speaker reflects on the grandeur of the church and the music that is often played during religious services. The use of the phrase long drawn aisle and fretted wall suggests a sense of grandeur and magnificence. The next stanza reflects on the idea that the dead are remembered through their impact on those around them. The speaker questions whether grand monuments, such as urns or statues, can truly capture the essence of the dead. The phrase animated bust suggests a sense of life and movement, which is not possible for the dead. The speaker questions whether even the honor of being remembered can bring the dead back to life. The use of the phrase silent dust suggests the finality of death. The speaker questions whether even flattery, which is often used to praise the living, can have any effect on the dead. The use of the phrase dull cold ear of death suggests a sense of finality and disinterest. The next stanza asserts that the dead are remembered through their impact on those around them. The speaker reflects on the possibility that someone important may be buried in the churchyard, even though their grave may not be grand or noticeable. The speaker says that someone buried in the churchyard may have once had a heart full of passion and ambition. The phrase celestial fire suggests a sense of greatness or divinity. The speaker suggests that someone buried in the churchyard may have had the potential to be a great leader or ruler. The use of the phrase rod of empire suggests a sense of power and authority. The speaker suggests that someone buried in the churchyard may have been a great musician or poet. 
The use of the phrase living liar suggests a sense of creativity and artistry. The speaker reflects on the idea that the dead may not have had access to knowledge or education, which could have helped them achieve greatness in life. The word ample suggests that there is a wealth of knowledge available. The dead may not have had access to the wealth of knowledge available in the world. The phrase spalls of time suggests that knowledge is something that is gained over time. The speaker suggests that poverty may have prevented the dead from achieving greatness or fulfilling their potential. The phrase noble raid suggests a sense of passion or ambition that was suppressed by poverty. The speaker suggests that poverty may have prevented the dead from experiencing the full range of human emotions and passions. The use of the phrase genial current of the soul suggests a sense of vitality and liveliness that was stifled by poverty. The next stanza reflects on the idea that the dead are remembered through their impact on those around them. The speaker reflects on the idea that many great people may have been buried in the churchyard, even though their graves may not be grand or noticeable. The use of the phrase gem of purest ray serene suggests a sense of purity and brilliance. The speaker suggests that many great people may have gone unrecognized and unremembered, much like treasures that are hidden away in the depths of the ocean. The speaker reflects on the idea that many great people may have lived their lives in obscurity and gone unrecognized. The use of the phrase born to blush unseen suggests a sense of potential and beauty that was not realized. The speaker suggests that many great people may have had their potential and beauty wasted, much like the sweet fragrance of a flower that goes unnoticed in the desert air. The final stanza reflects on the idea that the dead are remembered through the impact they had on the world. The speaker suggests that even someone from a small village may have had a great impact on the world. The use of the name Hamden suggests a sense of bravery and patriotism. The speaker suggests that someone from a small village may have stood up to a tyrant and fought for justice. The use of the phrase little tyrant suggests a sense of oppression and injustice. The speaker suggests that even someone who was unknown or unrecognized in their lifetime may have had great talent or potential. The use of the name Milton suggests a sense of literary greatness. He remarks that even someone who may have been controversial or unpopular in their lifetime may still be remembered for their impact on the world. This line describes the desire to receive recognition and admiration from important people, such as politicians or lawmakers. This line expresses the idea of being able to withstand threats and intimidation without giving in to fear. This line refers to the desire to contribute to society and improve the lives of others by creating abundance and happiness. This line suggests that the desire to be remembered by future generations is a driving force behind many people's ambitions. This line highlights the limitations of social class and circumstance in preventing individuals from reaching their full potential. It also suggests that even the virtuous are held back by their own faults and weaknesses. This line refers that power and success should not be gained through violence and that leaders should have compassion for their fellow human beings. This line shows the importance of honesty and authenticity and the difficulty people have in hiding their true feelings and thoughts. The stanza highlights the idea that even ordinary people can leave a mark on the world by living a life of moral and ethical values and by making positive contributions to their community. The speaker acknowledges that the lives of these unheralded individuals may go unnoticed by the larger world, but their memories and legacies continue to live on in the hearts and minds of those who knew them. The stanza also contemplates the idea of mortality and the inevitability of death. The speaker questions whether it is possible for someone to willingly let go of life and accept death without any regrets or attachments. The speaker suggests that such a person may have found solace in the idea of an afterlife or in the belief that their soul will continue to exist beyond the confines of this world. This line suggests that living a quiet and peaceful life in the midst of nature, away from the hustle and bustle of the city, can be a fulfilling and meaningful way of living. 
It implies that those who lead such a life may not seek fame or recognition, but find contentment in the simple pleasures of life. The stanza also touches upon the human desire to be remembered after death and how even those who lead quiet lives can leave behind a legacy. The speaker suggests that even though these individuals may not have accomplished great things or gained widespread fame, they can still be remembered through small memorials, such as inscriptions on gravestones, which serve as a reminder of their existence and the impact they had on the world around them. This line suggests that those who are content with a simple life away from the chaos of the city are more likely to find peace and happiness. This line describes the temptation to indulge in material possessions and luxuries as a means of gaining recognition and status. The speaker then notes that even these humble, forgotten people still have some protection in death. A simple and uncouth memorial has been erected near their bones, and the unlettered muse has spelled out their names and years of life. Holy texts are scattered around the memorial, teaching the rustic moralist how to die. The speaker questions who could willingly give up their existence and not look back on the warmth and light of life, seeking refuge in the silence of forgetfulness. The parting soul of the dead relies on the comfort of a fond breast and the closing eye requires some pious drops, why even from the tomb, the voice of nature cries out. The poem ends with the speaker addressing an unknown person who has written this simple and artless tale of the forgotten dead. The speaker imagines that someone who reads this account in the future may wonder about the author's fate. A hoary-headed old man might recall seeing the author wandering through the countryside at dawn or lazing by a brook at noon. In the end, the speaker invites the reader to approach and read the epitaph on the tombstone beneath the aged thorn tree. The epitaph reveals that the youth buried here was unknown to fortune and fame but fair science did not frown on his humble birth. Melancholy marked him for her own, and his soul was sincere and generous. He gave all he had to the miserable, shading a tear for their pain, and in return, heaven sent him a friend. The speaker advises against trying to reveal the youth's merits or expose his frailties, for both now rest in the bosom of his father and his god. Overall, Elegy written in a country churchyard is a meditation on the fleeting nature of life and the idea that we should strive to make a positive impact on the world before we inevitably meet our own end. The speaker suggests that even those who may have been forgotten or overlooked in their lifetime may still have had a great impact on the world and that our true legacy lies not in our material possessions or status symbols but in the way we live our lives and treat others.